Who doesn't love a good spinoff? Well, the Pokemon series doesn't shy away from it, that's for sure. If I told you that there's over 80 Pokemon games, would you believe me? And that's without counting the alternate versions. Ever since the Western release of Pokemon in 1998, this franchise has been shooting out spinoffs faster than a kid running around with a Nerf Rapid Strike. It's one of those rare cases where it wasn't even a slow start. Pretty much right out of the gate, Nintendo and game developers, both Japanese and Western, were gonna milk the heck out of this thing. Good or bad, we're gonna make some kids buy Buy some Pokemon. Introduce them to the Burger King Gold Standard, get them in early on that Uncut Gyms lifestyle. This is one of those topics that's literally too large to fit into one video, so I figured I should take some time and highlight a few of the standouts and the weird ones. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be talking about Pokemon spin-offs. This video is actually a Patreon request from Viral Crush, so thank you so much for supporting the channel, and let's get into it. This is one of those video topics that's literally too large to fit into one video, so I figured we'd take a look at a couple of the really cool and weird ones. And what better way to go about it than to start from the beginning. Less than a year after Red and Blue punched America in the face, Pokemania was running rampant. The trading card game was having success and controversy with children fighting over first edition Charizards, the four kids dubbed anime was turning rice balls into donuts, and we were only a few months before the release of Yellow and the first movie. Imagine having the sheer confidence to call your film the first movie. But in the meantime, we needed something to hold the kids' attention, and in the same week, Nintendo of America decided to drop Pokemon Snap and Pokemon Pokemon Pinball. Why you would release them that close together, I have no idea, but I feel sorry for every parent ever everyone. Pokemon Snap existing is weird as heck, and it's definitely the most popular spinoff from this era. It completely removed the fighting aspect from the series that caught national flack for, quote, encouraging violence, and instead handed the player a camera. I mean, all you do is sit in a chair on rails and take pictures of cute monsters. It's literally one of the most innocuous games I can think of. That is, until you assault Meowth with apples and pester balls and yank his soul straight out of his body. Whoops. This game was neat and all, but the one I probably played of more as a kid was Pokemon Pinball, and upon revisiting it as an adult, I have no idea why. Pokemon Pinball is just one of a trillion licensed pinball video games, a category of games that isn't the most prestigious. Sure, we got fun ones like Metroid Prime Hunters and Sonic's Pinball, sans the soundtrack, but there's also like The Little Mermaid 2 Pinball Frenzy, Austin Powers Pinball, Akira Psycho Ball, Kiss Pinball, while the only pinball video game that matters is Space Cadet on Windows XP, Pokemon Pinball was pretty alright. You only got two maps here, and the premise is pretty simple. You hit the things to make Pokemon spawn, then you hit the Pokemon to catch it, and then you hit more things to make it evolve, and then you get big points. It's pinball, what's there to say? Well, there is a battery-powered rumble feature built into the game's cartridge, which made it look absolutely ridiculous. I just remember the hatch breaking off and running around the playground with an exposed battery like a cool guy. The ladies weren't prepared for my big points. There's actually a Pokedex for this, and according to how long to beat, Pokemon Pinball takes like 50 hours to 100%. 50 long hours of playing the same two boards over and over and listening to the occasional low quality soundbite of Pikachu screaming. <laughs> I'm good. I will, however, play the sequel to this that I feel kinda went under the radar, Pokemon Pinball Ruby and Sapphire. It's basically the exact same game, but 32 bits. In the original year, Pokeball would have to transfer between screens, but the Game Boy Advance version has vertical scrolling. It's pretty much the exact sequel you would expect a licensed pinball video game to be. Both of them have fantastic music, neat boss fights, and a simple premise that is strong enough to hold its own for however long you feel like playing. It, it's pinball, it's f***ing pinball. Between 1999 and 2002, the Poker Machine was in full effect. We would be getting mainline games and spinoffs every few months, some really fun and some, hey you Pikachu, or as I like to call it, the prototype for Seaman. Something really bad. Oh no. I don't think anyone thinks that in 2020, Hey You Pikachu is a good game. At least I hope not. Now, if they were made it with the same voice recognition technology we put in Alexa and Google, I think it could be a banger. But unfortunately, we just have to deal with this little rat face not listening to anything I say. The little microphone device, the voice recognition unit, was only compatible with this in some train simulation game on the N64. Densha to go too. 
Uh, attention all passengers, we've reached our stop, and now I need you to get off my train! Actually, I think Pokemon games are still, to this day, frequently used to sell some kind of accessory. Pedometers, Pokemon Pikachu, Pokemon Go Pokeball controllers, I assume we'll get some sort of thing for the highly anticipated Pokemon Sleep. Pre-order the Pokeball-shaped melatonin. Beyond the microphone, another Pokemon spinoff would give us one of the more unique accessories on the Nintendo 64, the Transfer Pack. Spelled incorrectly, of course. Nintendo didn't want to give us the C, and that still to this day makes me irrationally upset. The Transfer Pack was used to have Game Boy video games have interactivity with Nintendo 64 games, and this would be included with every copy of Pokemon Stadium. If you want to see your boys on the big screen, this is how you do it. Or if you no longer had a Super Game Boy and a Super Nintendo, you could use this to play them Pokemon on the TV. Or if you have both, you can just use whatever controller you like better. I think yeah, the answer is probably obvious. Pokemon Stadium's kind of not great though. The single player experience has nothing to offer beyond just battling. It's also so slow. There's better and faster ways to experience the Pokemon battle system, and one of them is to just pull up a spread sheet and do math. The only real reason to play Pokemon Stadium these days is if you want to get your minigame action on with some friends. These minigames were of Mario Party quality or better, and, and I'll tell you right now, you will never beat me and Clefairy says, never. There's only one other Nintendo 64 Pokemon spinoff, and it's hardly that. Pokemon Puzzle League, also known as literally Tetris Attack. For some reason, Nintendo and Intelligent Systems decided to take the 4Kids version of the Pokemon anime and transform it into a Pokemon skin for Tetris Attack. It's even got the 2 be a master soundtrack. Yeah, it sounds great. I got to be the one, the only one who can. We stand the test and be the best at it. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and say that the Nintendo 64's lack of a dedicated sound chip was a hindrance or anything, but Yasunori Mitsuda, this is not. Bummer man, huh? It's Tetris Attack, except with all of the charm of Pokemon and Tetris Attack sucked out of it. Nice job, guys. They did, however, do way better a mere three months later on the Game Boy Color with Pokemon Puzzle Challenge. This game is also Tetris Attack, except you can tell there's a little more of that Nintendo polish put into it. It's got a cute animation at the beginning of the boot up as a opposed to like a Pokeball opening. The music feels more Pokemon and less four kids Los Angeles studio musician. It's hard to believe that a Game Boy version of a Super Nintendo game feels better than the Nintendo 64 one, but hey, make that money, honey. I think I've grown used to surprises. Also, it has a larger variety of gameplay styles. Beyond just Tetris Attack, Professor Oak says you can do this. I guess this makes sense, considering all of the professors are named after trees. Gotta catch them all, man. These spinoffs have let us see what a franchise can look like under different genres, and I think they've been mostly successful. But how about when the video game gets a spinoff card game that then gets a spinoff spinoff video game of the spinoff card game, I don't, I don't have any cards to hold in my hands, but Pokemon TCG, yay! Now, I've only played Pokemon's TCG a few times, but I do know that it's pretty dang similar to Magic. I, however, prefer my card games to be a bit more dramatic without the constraints of a table and ridiculous hair. However, when Wizards of the Coast and the Pokemon Company decided that they were going to make a video game adaptation of the popular card game based on the runaway hit Pokemon trademark, they instead made this. Hey, my name is Julie. I'm a Pokemon trainer, just like you. Oh my God. Before Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy Color would come out in the West, we would get Pokemon Play It for the PC. Oh, it's cursed. I can't imagine this is gonna make anyone wanna play the trading card game, but uh, this however did. Hudson's Pokemon TCG video game is a pretty perfect representation of the source material at the time. Yeah, it's evolved a ton since then, as you'd expect with what, 20 plus years of it existing, but like Yu-Gi-Oh, these two card game video games were pretty spot on. Not to mention they absolutely killed it in the presentation. It just feels like a normal Pokemon game, but instead of monster fighting, it's card games. You are on your journey to become the best card gamer in the land. You even get the satisfaction of opening booster packs without spending real money. A mild amount of dopamine. The bigger dose comes from any time you have the volume on. The soundtrack is bound to put a smile on your face.
Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy Color, also known as Pokemon TCG GBC, is one of those pleasant old school portable games that feels cozy. This actually got a Japanese only sequel that's closer to a 1.5 type of deal considering it uses the exact same sprites, music, maps, and I mean cards. But this was the last of the spin-offs on the Nintendo 64 and Game Boy Color. Well, besides Pokemon Stadium 2, but that's a game I prefer not to speak about. It's not bad or anything, it's just like, you know when you're a kid and you trade in all of your games? Now from here, things get weird. Not that pinball isn't a weird choice, but I'd like to think a game where you just watch TV with Pikachu is a bit stranger. Pokemon Channel was one of those games that I never played personally, but instead watched someone else play, which I guess means I watched somebody watch Pikachu watch TV as you do. At this point, they were just slapping the Pokemon name on a box of something and calling it a day, even letting Western developers take a crack at it. Like Pokemon Team Turbo. Brought to us by the developers of the Dragon Ball Z card game video game, Team Turbo is a racing game. This is like one of those old Flash games you could find on Neopets or the Cartoon Network website, except somehow worse and it costs actual money. I'll never know how these like awful Flash looking PC game collections got made, but it happened with like every franchise. You go to Staples as a kid and you see that they have a video game section and you're like, wow, video games. And then you pick up Sailor Moon and her Sailor Scouts computer fun set. Sick. They're girls and cousins too. Around the same time, Pokemon would be getting spinoffs on the DS like Ranger and Dash. They just wanted the player to take the stylus and mash it up against the touch screen like a scratch off. The GameCube had Colosseum and XD Gale of Darkness, which is one I had always wanted to try, but when you're playing vanilla World of Warcraft, you don't play any other games. XD is kind of like Stadium and Colosseum, but faster and with an actual narrative. The thing that people wanted in the first place. Unfortunately, in reviews, it only did okay, which is probably why we didn't see a full RPG console Pokemon until this recent generation. I might visit this one another day more in depth because it's super interesting, but for now, I wanna hop on over to the Wii. I always found it fun to browse the Wii shop channel back when it was around, rest in peace, and around this time, Nintendo liked to experiment with some of their franchises. You don't gotta spend a million dollars on a Mario Galaxy when you can just spend $400, a couple of specs, gift cards, and a BLT on micro games. My Pokemon Ranch. You got a copy of Diamond and Pearl? Are you in the past and Pokemon Bank doesn't exist yet? Use this and I guess just look at them. I mean, I guess this works. So imagine you're pitching the concept of like, hey, let's make a game where you pay for it and you have the ability to store your Pokemon so that when you go into the game, you can see them on the big screen. But then they kind of just look like a McDonald's toy. Not that I expected Detective Pikachu levels of detail, but at least it's cute. My Pokemon Ranch would become obsolete when Bank was released, as well as the whole WiiWare getting shut down thing, but these models would get milked two more times. Once in Pokemon Fushigi no Dungeon, which, let me just push that to the side for a second, and a second time in the spinoff that stood out to me the most, Pokemon Rumble. It's hard not to love a good old multiplayer beat-em-up, and Pokemon Rumble sure is one of them. Rumble was actually the first game I ever bought digitally on a console, I'm not sure what about it was calling to me. Maybe it was my lust for a new Baldur's Gate or a console Diablo, but it sure only like barely satisfied that craving. Rumble is an exercise in number go up. You start out as a lone Rattata hoping to win the Pokemon Battle Royale when you walk in and it gets smashed. Oh, so it's time to get more powerful, and you do so by fighting other Pokemon, stealing their bodies, tossing your weaker Pokemon into the trash, and watching number go up. I guess you're just supposed to be playing as a kid, staring down at the field, since you start up these Pokemon toys with wind-up keys. Am I the key? It's super simple. You got either one or two moves per Pokemon. All of them follow the normal elemental trees. If you only have one attack though and you press the button, whatever you're playing as looks up at the screen, which is super cute, but you know it's just sitting there like, this guy, this freaking guy thinks I got two attacks. How dare. Once you beat all six levels, you do the battle royale, win or lose, and then you do it all again. And again. And again. It's literally the same patch of levels over and over until you beat Mewtwo. But what more could you ask from a game that's maybe like 50 megabytes? 
Pokemon Rumble spinoff was successful enough to have five different games, all of them with a lukewarm reception. Yeah. Of all of these, the one I played the most was on Nintendo's Black Sheep console, the Wii U. People like the 3DS one, Rumble Blast well enough, I guess, but Pokemon Rumble U took that formula and like stripped it down to the bone. And considering that formula is already really bare, you can only imagine. Gone are the levels you travel through, it's just boss arenas now. I hope you like circular platforms, cause that's, that's it. It looks like the models were reused again, actually, except with that signature Wii U gloss. Everything looks like it's been lathered up, like it has some greasy gamer fingers all over it. I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, that Pokemon Rumble U kinda sucked. We're talking about all these fancy spinoffs, but I think that we need to get back to the basics. Let's talk about who your favorite Pokemon trainer is. Is it Brock, Misty, Jasmine? Well, my favorite trainer should be obvious. Oda Nobunaga. Yeah, I'm serious. Once upon a time in 2012, Koei Tecmo teamed up with Nintendo to bring us a crossover of Pokemon and Nobunaga's ambition. The result is probably my favorite Pokemon spinoff and one of the more unique games in both series, Pokemon Conquest. You play as you, a Pokemon warlord in the lesser known region of Ransay, a place without the constraint of balls, instead using the shackles of friendship and extremely attractive anime characters. Conquest is a light-hearted and fun take on the Sengoku period of feudal Japan, incorporating it directly into the Pokemon lore. Is it canon? I don't know. But there's this one clever line about the people of Ransei being confused by trainers across the world, shoving Pokemon into Pokeballs, and that was cool, that was world building, I liked it, A+. plus. Sure, the available Pokemon you can use are extremely limited by normal Pokemon standards, even more so than Sword and Shield, I know. But to make up for that, it's not just the Pokemon that can evolve, but also the people. I'm a real warlord now. In addition to your strategy RPG battles, you also have town management and map activities you can do as you expand your empire. Pokemon in battle can be assisted by items and specific warlord abilities, but it's nothing overly complex. Like baby's first tactical RPG. But when you go casual with it, that means it's like a gateway drug to getting more people to play Tactics Ogre Let Us Clean together, and that's what really matters. Conquest ain't super long, it's not that difficult, but it is the exact type of thing I like to see. Spin-off crossovers aren't too common, these days, but like, if you're sitting there and combining Pokemon and Final Fantasy Tactics, I'm gonna give you money. Don't test me. How one series can have a trading card game, strategy RPG, and a pinball video game all coexist is completely beyond me, but I'm not complaining. That's not even close to the end of it. Sure, there's no Gajinka dating sim yet. But we do have an absurd amount of variety here. Sometimes they would be functionally like My Pokemon Ranch and essentially be a way to look at Pokemon you caught like Pokedex 3D Pro. Other times they would be full on unique spin-offs where you play as a Pokemon like in the Wii's Poke Park games. Japanese only arcade games, we got them. There's 3DS Street Pass based games like Tozukoto 1000 Bikino Pokemon. Did I say that right? Or hey, if you want a Pokemon skin for the literal best video game ever, Picross, you got it. Need to learn how to type properly? Well, there's a Pokemon typing game for the 3DS. One that comes with a physical keyboard. Will this keyboard work with any other game or device? Absolutely not, but it, it exists. Also, there were some spinoff where you like walk outside and loiter around at Denny's, but I don't, I don't know much about that one. I don't go outside. I think that game also has clones of its own and maybe one day I'll brave the streets to get into those, but for now, I wanna dive into one last specific game. While there are so, so many Pokemon spinoffs that we can talk about, I wanna end today's video on the actual request from Viral Crush. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team and Blue Mist... Mr. Blue Rescue. <laughs> Mystery Dungeon is such a strange thing. We've talked about a few of these on the channel before, specifically some of the Chocobo Dungeon ones, but that's as far as we've gone. Even though the series started as a Dragon Quest spinoff, even though they have an original IP with the concept Sheer and the Wanderer, it's definitely most notable as a Pokemon game. When you say Mystery Dungeon, people aren't like, ooh, Twinbee Mystery Dungeon. Though they should. Red and Blue are strange because they're the same game but on different platforms. Red being on Game Boy Advance and Blue on the DS. I tried out both for this video, but we're gonna roll with Blue because it looks, runs, and sounds way better. Game Boy sounds awful. So if you don't know Mystery Dungeon, it's pretty simple. It's a turn-based dungeon exploration RPG where the floors are randomly generated. When you die, you're out of there, sometimes with really harsh penalties. Sometimes you'll lose literally everything you have, but in Pokemon, just like Conquest, it's a gateway drug. 
If you were to look at Mystery Dungeon by itself, they're generally very gamey games. There's an overarching narrative, but it's usually inconsequential or save the world kind of jumbo. But what Pokemon did differently than others like Chocobo and Torneco was give us an actual emotionally gripping story. That's right, this game right here might make you cry. You start in a dreamlike state answering questions similar to you Dragon Quest 3. Time to personally answer this personality test to become a similar Pokemon. You got a bunch of picks from the first three gens and I got me out but not before it told me I was selfish, fickle, unreliable, and childish. Dang, dude. After being publicly dunked on, you get to pick a partner Pokemon, and I went with Brotodile because I couldn't say no to that face. Not in a million years. Oh yeah, BT Dubs, you aren't actually a Pokemon. You're some dude that wakes up in a Pokemon's body. It's Isekai. There you find your new best friend, in my case, Totodile, and you band together to form a rescue team in order to help save Pokemon that find themselves in trouble. It's a simple and harmless premise to start with, but some of the story beats get, like, real. First, you're helping a lost Diglett. Next thing you know, you're being hunted down. Next thing you know, you can't stop crying. Next thing you know, you're 30 and you're paying your taxes and crying. Are these related? I don't know. Since as a Pokemon you can't catch Pokemon, that would be weird, you instead become friends with them. There's a chance whenever you beat one in combat they'll want to join up with you and you can add them to your potential dungeon crawler friends list. Though managing three or four allies at a time in a dungeon can be a bit tedious. After a bit, you turn into a real estate mogul, purchasing up all the land to give all your new friends cheap rent. You've got the entire town running an economy based on your exploits. That includes the training dojo. I don't see anyone else in there. This town belongs to us. Combat is initially pretty simple, but the longer the dungeons get, the more you gotta figure out how to conserve your hunger and PP. <laughs> Especially when the enemies are getting tougher and you're needing to chain moves together while utilizing stat restoration, buffing items. Look, look, if you like the number thing, this game lets you enjoy the number thing. Also, the soundtrack, as you can hear in the background right now, is a total bop. They just nailed it with this one all around. And Pokemon Mystery Dungeons held in pretty high regard for not just Pokemon fans, but also Mystery Dungeon. I think that's obvious considering how many freaking sequels this one got. Explorers of Time, Darkness, and Sky, the Japanese only WiiWare tree of games blazing light and stormy adventures. It's probably the best usage of those small models, by the way. There's also Gates to Avidity on the 3DS and the most recent new release, Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon in 2015. I would never played these before making this video, but I'll tell you now, I will play a 3DS game. I will do it. It looks like Nintendo wants people to give it a shot as well, considering Red and Blue Rescue were recently remade for the Switch as Rescue Team DX, the newest one, until sleep comes out. Pokemon go to, f to sleep. Although I'm not sure if this was the best way to show it. Sure, it follows the same story and sure it has a bunch of new stuff, but they made some choices that bring it down a bit. They implemented an auto mode into the dungeon crawling, which is fine, but it makes the gameplay seem very much like it's not the focus of what they're trying to do. Plus there's some weird input lag in the menu, which kind of sucks and visually it's kind of a mess. Yeah, you guys can do better. I know you can. I just played one. Even though the new shiny HD version of this game is appealing, the original spin-off is definitely worth your time. Though both versions will call you a man-child. Also, at some point, Lombre said that Alakazam was endowed with an IQ of 5,000, and I don't like the word endowed, so now you have to look at it. Okay, bye. That's all for today's video, and shout out again to my boy Viral Crush for picking today's topic. It was a good one, and I will probably come back to it, maybe just to talk about XT, I don't know. There's so many Pokemon spinoffs to talk about, and Lord knows that they're never gonna stop. Next time we're gonna be talking about 7 Remake. I already beat it. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Brandon Howe, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Cliff Pro, Donald Dowdy, David Molnar, Eli Shane Stauffenegger, Final Fantasy Blog, Jane Jones, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Josh Garbage Lord, Kieran Arter, Plasma Phoenix, and Vlad Lust. Thank you very much for your generous support. I'm hoping to have the remake video out in just a couple days, so stay tuned for that. Also, I love you guys. Take care of yourself. Eat a carrot.